Hi, it's Miss Blanchard. Uh, this is the first in a series of at-home lectures we're going to do for uh, period 6, which is chapters 18, 19, and parts of 20. These questions come straight from the College Board, and like I said, we're going to revisit them at the end of the unit, but they're good to kind of start to understand now. Our two warm-up questions for you to think about, to what extent had the United States developed a national market economy by the outbreak of the Civil War? Though certainly not completely answered by it, really kind of focus your thoughts on when we talked about the Triple Revolution last year, and especially the market revolution that's part of that, and that will kind of help you start you brainstorming for this question. And our other warm-up question, what developments were still needed to improve America's national market economy? And really think about um, shortfalls we talked about with the Civil War um, and supply lines there um, when addressing that question. So the Gilded Age, what is the Gilded Age? It's a term given to this era from the end of the Civil War, 1865, until 1900. Um, it refers, gilding refers to any kind of cheap metal um, that's coated with a more expensive metal, usually uh, gold, silver. Today a lot of um, jewelry uses palladium. It's a very expensive metal. Um, and Mark Twain actually meant it as a critique of the era, that you, um, he called it gilding a lily. You take something expensive and you put expensive metal right on top of it um, to kind of describe the over decadence, the conspicuous consumption of the Gilded Age. Um, and the reaction to that overconsumption, the conspicuous consumption, um, is going to have political, economic, and social repercussions, and the discontent will lead to the Progressive Era, which is one of the first things we'll talk about um, in the next unit, period seven. So <clears throat> we kind of look at five themes when we look at the Gilded Age in this class. Um, the North, business, industry, immigration, we'll talk about that more in chapter 19. Um, the South, spe specifically the New South, and discrimination. We touched on discrimination um, at the end of last year when we talked about Reconstruction, and so we're going to uh, just kind of touch on it again, um, but this is going to be a big theme we're going to talk about all through U.S. 2. What we're focusing on today will be the West, uh, especially the continuation of Manifest Destiny, the search for raw materials. Um, what we'll talk about probably more in the next unit will be imperialism, and also in this unit as well as the next unit will be forms of discontent, labor discontent, urban discontent, and agrarian discontent. So chapter 18, uh, this is kind of an introduction to the unit. Um, we're talking about American expansion and Manifest Destiny and the ideas of how did the search for new global markets affect foreign policy and territorial ambitions. Foreign policy we'll talk about more when we talk about imperialism. Today we're talking more about te territorial ambitions. And then in what ways and to what extent was the West open for further settlement through connection to Eastern political, financial, and transportation systems. So just a little refresher on Manifest Destiny. John O'Sullivan, he was a Democratic newspaper editor and wrote that newspaper article in 1940, or I'm sorry, in 1845, um, where he used the term Manifest Destiny. It's manifest, it's clear, it's obvious that our destiny is to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And he's using kind of the... Um, religious lingo of the Second Great Awakening, calling us God's chosen nation, that God wants us, we're his chosen people, to become a stronger nation. And his idea is that the expansion of democracy from the East into the West um, and economic opportunities is a good thing, though this will be um, challenged more and more, especially when we get to the um, imperialism of the 1880s and the 1890s. So, the effects, immediate effects of the Civil War are these five big Civil War acts. And these are all part of the Republican Party platform. The withdrawal of Southern opposition, so they're very easily passed, and they're major cornerstones of the Republican uh, platform. But think back, these would have fit right in with Henry Clay's American system, Henry Clay's um, three-pronged attack to internal, uh, of internal improvements, which that if you go back even further, is comes from Hamilton's economic plans and his desire. The first thing is the moral tariff. You don't need to know any specific numbers for the moral tariff. Just know it's another tariff. It's one of the continuations. We talked about Hamilton's tariff 
We talked about Henry Clay's tariff. Um, there was the Tariff of Abominations, the Tariff of 1832, and the Compromise Tariff. So with the exception of the Compromise Tariff, with, which lowered the tariff, the Moral Tariff just continues to raise the tariff, just like all of the rest of them had done as well. And this is going to go on to be an increasing issue, well, almost until 1900, and even into the 1900s, is this increasing tariff that the North feels protects industry and the South feels um, hits them unfairly. The next one, and we'll talk more about it in depth later, is the Homestead Act that gave homesteaders federal land in the West uh, for free or drastically reduced prices. The next is the Moral Land Grant. It gives individual states federal lands if they agree to either use the land or use the money from the sale of lands to finance colleges. The next one is the Pacific Railroad Act, giving land grants and sometimes monetary grants to railroad companies, which are going to form the cornerstone of the American society and economy uh, in the second industrial revolution. And lastly, the Legal Tender Act and the National Banking Act is going to be the first systematic nationalized banking system, even more so than the first and second banks of the United States, but are going to, especially the Legal Tender Act, going to constantly bring up the issue of currency, currency distribution to debate. And that's where a lot of our agrarian discontent is going to focus its discontent on. Okay, so here's a map of the United States, kind of the territories. Um, the red areas are states. I believe this is as of 1880, um, and we'll see uh, another map in a moment. But our three areas we're going to talk about are three regions of the country. We talked a lot about last year about sectionalism, the same sections. So this is the South. That's going to be focused on Reconstruction, which we've already dealt with, the rise of Jim Crow segregation, which we've talked about and we'll touch on again, as well as the New South, which will be a new concept to you. This is New England um, and kind of the east, Upper East Coast. They're what I call the isations, industrialization, urbanization, and what we should probably really add to this is also immigration. Uh, and then in the West, we're going to be talking about especially ranching, mining, and farming, as well as the impact on Native Americans. So here's the map of the United States again. The West manifest destiny is continuing after 1865. Miners, homesteaders because of the Homestead Act, and ranchers all head into the West um, and open up the land to increase development. This is the United States we know. Um, look at the drastic change from 1880 to 1890. So here again is the map of the United States with all the modern states. Um, and our question is kind of what is the American frontier? In 1763, the Proclamation Line had made the American frontier, the Appalachian Mountains. Remember, the colonists are very upset about this. They completely disregard it and go f um, flowing into the West, um, which was set aside for Indians anyway. And it's the real first political discontent against the British monarchy. And that's eventually uh, going to lead along with taxation and the Intolerable Acts and a lot of other things we talked about last year to the American Revolution and the creation of the United States in 1783, which you'll notice on the right in white, um, from the Atlantic to the Mississippi between Canada and Florida. Florida, of course, belonging to the Spanish until the Adams and Nice Treaty and Canada being British. Um, but what then was the West? Well, it was still actually in the United States. And so in 1783, the Articles of Confederation enacted one of only two really effective laws, and that's the Land Act of 1783 that took all of these Western lands that weren't states and they just were kind of owned by the federal government and figured out an orderly system for the survey and the sale. Remember we looked at the blocks and how they um, divided them up first into miles and then half miles, quarter miles, and down to townships and then blocks that could be sold off. First of all, it helped provide funding for the federal government, but second of all, you really only had 14 states. You had the original 13 colonies that became the 13 states, and Vermont was added the next year. But it gave settlers in those states, or it gave Americans in those states, the opportunity to move to the West to buy land and settle in the West for pretty reasonable prices. Uh, the second of the two effective laws is actually passed in 1783, and that was the Northwest Ordinances, which takes those lands above the Ohio River and figures out a way for them to enter the Union first as organized territories and then eventually as states. 
and that's so successful it's going to be applied south of the Ohio River and then west of the Mississippi as we continue to expand. It's one of the few laws that the Articles of Confederation had passed that Congress also adopted, and it's done pretty rapidly after the writing of the Constitution. So that had been trans-Appalachian migration. But then, after 1803, we enter trans-Mississippi migration, the opening up of the, of the West by the Louisiana Purchase, um, doubling the size of the United States virtually overnight. And Americans started flowing into Iowa, Missouri, and Missouri, especially in 1820, became a flashpoint over the Missouri Compromise. And how are we going to enter these states? We know the process from the, North, uh, the land ordinances and the Northwest Ordinances of 1785 but really now the issue is the slavery question. And of course, in 1854 to 1856 and 7, Kansas and Nebraska are going to become a flashpoint because of the slavery issue, leading all into the Civil War. Um, at the same time, Americans were migrating southward as well, first in Alabama fever, uh, but then in the 1830s into Texas, those original impresarios like C um, Moses Austin and his son Stephen Austin, uh, flow into Texas agreeing that they'll stop owning slaves, they'll become Catholic, they'll speak Spanish, but after only a few short years they don't do any of these things. And so in the 1830s start the Texan War for Independence. Um, they are not annexed. They spend 10 years as an independent republic and are eventually annexed in 1845. Well what's the result of that? is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which adds all of these lands now to the United States. California becomes a state in 1850. Uh, through the Compromise of 1850, it had only been a year and a half since the California gold rush um, had struck, and so Americans had poured into California, giving it enough of a population. Uh, the Compromise of 1850 also had provisions for Utah and New Mexico to enter as territories eventually with the idea that they would become states. At the same time, remember, Polk's campaign slogan had been 50 for 40 or fight. So in the 1840s, you also saw Oregon fever. Just as settlers had poured into Texas, had started moving into California's with the Rancheros program, settlers had also moved into Oregon for the, uh, for the farming and the access to the Pacific Ocean. And that 50 for 40 or fight was settled by the treaty with Canada in 1846. And this really became the United States. Um, you know, this is by the time of the Civil War, the United States we kind of know is formed and our territories are solidified. On the tail end of the Civil War in 1867, Alaska is also purchased, purchased by Secretary of State Seward. And at the time, um, your textbook calls it Seward's Icebox. That is a criticism of it. It was used uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek or sarcastically. Um, a lot of times, though, it's also called Seward's Folly. A lot of Americans for the next 30 years could not figure out why would we buy a hunk of unconnected, ice-dominated um, land so far north. Alaska somewhat redeems itself in the 1890s when the Klondike Gold Rush happens and there's so much gold that flows into the American economy, it actually reverses a 20-year-long long depression, known as the Long Depression, from 1873 until the 1890s. The last place we have to look at is also in the 1890s, uh, the annexation. I put the arrow here on the Caribbean, meaning we're looking towards Cuba, Puerto Rico, and exerting some control in Latin America. You could also add Hawaii and even the Philippines to that list. So why are we going west? That's our question really for this unit, uh, is the west. Well, you see in the Midwest especially lots of cropland for growing food, but as we go further west, rather than growing cropland, you see cattle um, and some sheep ranching, uh, more um, corn and wheat croplands as well, but even more food and more access to industry, as well as what's not really displayed on the map here, mining. And that's what the far west, the trans-rocky mi migration that's going to start happening after the Civil War is going to open up, is mining and even more farming, especially in the form of ranching. Western raw materials fueled eastern factories, um, allowing them what we talked about last year, not just food to feed the factory workers, but also now the raw materials as the scope of industrialization really expanded more from just um, looms and power weaving. 
Um, in the West, though, here's a map with the Native American tribes. All of this comes at the expense of Native Americans. So I think we're done here for today. We'll pick up tomorrow with mining and farming.